All right, grams and moles. Yeah, grams and moles. So what we do, right, we change the percentages. Take these percentages, turn them into grams, uh, and we say 40 grams of carbon, 6.71 grams of hydrogen, and 53.3 grams of oxygen. Then we change the percents into grams. So we got those percentages from the problem when we turned them into grams. Then we take those gram values and do what with them? Find out how many grams are in mold. So we use the periodic table. Um, right. So reminder, I have these memorized, but okay, we know that um, carbon up here is 12 grams per mole, oxygen is 16, and hydrogen is 1. Okay, so 12 grams per one mole of carbon. 1.0 grams of hydrogen is one mole of hydrogen, and 16.0 grams of oxygen is one mole of oxygen. I think I said moles, but yeah, you guys got it. So this one's easy. I can do this one without a calculator. 6.71 moles of hydrogen. Other ones, I'm going to have to pull up my calculator. Uh, 40 divided by 12. Okay, we get 3.33 moles of oxygen. Okay, we divide by the smallest. The smallest is 3.33. So we divide them all by 3.33, and we get 1, 2, 1. Okay, so that means our empirical formula is CH2O. Okay, but if we look at CH2O, right, does CH2O have a mass of 180? No. CH2O, if we add it up, 12 plus 1 times 2 plus 16, that is 30. All right? How does 30 compare to 180? Well, in order to get 30 up to 180, you have to multiply it by 6. And so that way we know our molecular formula is C6H12O6, or as a lot of people in the chat are saying, glucose. All right? So this unknown white powder turns out to be glucose. Okay, cool. So sugar, yeah, simple sugar. And thus not cocaine, not this time. It could have been, but it's not. <laughs> cocaine has nitrogen in it, I think. I don't remember the formula for cocaine. Hey, <laughs> thanks for the follow, Dub. Um, no, we're, we're done uh, with practice um, on those. So we're going to move on to rates. Um, oh, sorry, Lauren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I should do a better job explaining that, Tyler. So um, the reason why we know it's times six is we compare this 30 to the 180 that was given in the problem. And if you take 180 and divide it by 30, you get six. And so that's how we know C6H1206, because if we add this up, that's gonna give us our 180. Um, let's see. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, Cooper, your audio is having some issues. Um, yeah, we just have one more test here. We have an assignment due Thursday, and then we have a test. So we have two assignments left, one assignment and then the final. Um, Tyler, did I answer your question? Okay, yeah, yeah I did. Good. Uh, yeah, we're moving into some notes on rates. So we just finished molecular practice. Um, this, the test for this unit and the final are mushed together, Kate, because we just ran out of time. Uh, probably not a whole lot, Simon. Maybe just like 100 points, 150 points or something. When do we do the learns on the final? <laughs> what? So Olivia, we've been learning things that are going to be on the final for the, the whole time we've been on break and before we went on break. Um, we'll review everything you need to know for the final on, on Friday, Tiara. Yeah, they did it last time. I think people are getting close. Oh, it was at the end of class. You might have missed it, Cooper. Uh, I don't know if someone clipped it. Okay. <laughs> Stream a Kahoot. I might do that. Um, I still have to finish like how I want to do the final. Um, Simon, I'm, I'm going to figure that out. I haven't actually like mashed it all together yet. <laughs> Cooper, someone will get to 10K again, don't worry. Ah. All right, let's talk about rates. So we, we've we talked a lot about chemical reactions up to this point. We've talked about you know the five types of reactions. We've talked about um, some math associated with equations. Um, but we haven't talked about what determines how fast or slow a reaction goes. And so that's kind of going to be our, our last topic. The last thing I get to teach you guys is, you know, what determines, you know, the speed of a reaction. So we're going to start the whole thing talking about the underlying theory behind understanding rates of reactions. <clears throat> okay, so the underlying theory behind rates of reactions is something called collision theory. Um, collision theory states that, um, I don't, I think you might be able to manually like ignore their messages, but I'm not sure if you can actually block people as Zach. All right. Collision theory. So collision theory basically states that in order for a reaction to occur, Molecules and atoms have to physically collide, right? So it's this idea that, um, that in order for a reaction to happen, that your particles and your molecules have to physically hit. There were When this was first being developed, there was a group of people that kind of argued that uh, they don't necessarily have to collide. They could just be in the close vicinity. But collision theory states that in order for two atoms or molecules to react with each other, they have to physically collide with each other. Okay, uh, and there's a few details of it, right? So they have to they have to collide with enough energy, right? And um, they have to collide in the proper orientation, All right? When you get some large complicated molecules, those large complicated molecules have to be oriented in the correct way so that a collision can form a successful compound. Okay. 
Um, needs to form what's called the activated complex. Okay. Um, so the activated complex is this kind of quasi weird transition state that um, has all of the reactant bonds combining and the product bonds breaking. Okay, so we can visualize it this way. Let's imagine that we have like, uh, you know, say, say this compound here reacting with, you know, this compound here. We'll give these some dashes to form um, something like this. Right. So the two are coming together to form this other compound here. And so the activated complex is kind of this weird in-between thing where everything is all together. Right? <clears throat> so it's where they collide, but then they haven't broken apart to form these two new co two new co uh, two new compounds. Ugh. Um, but they're all kind of weird together. So this is called the activated complex. It's where the reactant bonds are breaking and the product bonds are forming. Um, we can actually express this graphically. Um, so we can draw, right, <clears throat> we can do a quick just kind of graph where we put, um, just do energy on the y-axis. So something like that. So we have uh, reactants and products. Right? And then up the tip top of this, this is our activated complex. Right? So in order to form yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm going a little fast. Let me slow down. Sorry, guys. So again, this is rates, collision theory. In order for a reaction to occur, molecules and atoms have to physically collide. They have to collide with enough energy, and they have to collide in the proper orientation. Okay, And then when they collide, they need to form this thing called the activated complex. The activated complex is this in-between quasi-state where your um, reactant bonds are beginning to break and your product bonds are beginning to form, but it's kind of halfway in between. It's a very high energy transition state, which is why as we go from reactants to products, the activated complex is way up here. It's just kind of this barrier that we have to go through. Um, so there's not a lot of energy produced. It, it, cons it absorbs energy in order to form. So in order to form this, we absorb energy. That energy that needs to be absorbed, right? this energy here, is called the activation energy. Right? So in order to form this activated complex, you have to put in enough energy to form the... Um, called the activation energy, right? And so there's this big old bump in order to form. Now, once the activated complex forms and it goes to the products, it'll release energy then. And so we could say overall, right, this amount of energy is what gets released. And we actually had a term for that way back at the start of the try. We called this delta H, right? It was the heat energy. And so because reactant, because the products are lower than the reactants, this reaction gives off energy. 
although you have to put in enough energy in order to form the activated complex. Okay, um, questions on that? I know I'm kind of going a little fast, but I want to get to a demonstration. So reactants, products. Oh, this um, this bottom thing can be called, you can call it a couple different things. You can call it reaction coordinate. I'm just going to call it reaction progress. But like if it takes energy for the compound to react, does that mean there's a point where they can't react anymore because they're out of energy? No, not in this case, Olivia, because in this case, it does take energy going this way, but once it forms and it drops down, all that energy gets released back out, right? So it takes in energy and then it releases a bunch out. It's kind of like when you have, when you're trying to light something on fire, right? In order to get it to start burning, you have to provide some sort of spark. You have to put energy into it. But once you get it burning, the amount of energy you get back out is a lot more than the amount of energy you had to put in. Does that make sense? So you do have to put in energy, yes, but in this case, because the products are way down here, lower in energy, the amount of energy you get back out is more than the energy you put in. This is an exothermic reaction. But for some reactions that are endothermic, yeah, you would have to like constantly supply energy in order for the reaction to continue to, to progress. I know that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the reasons why the world isn't collapsing. Yes, very important that the world is not collapsing with all the reactions that we're doing. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to take a break here, and let's let's do some stuff. Okay. I've got some lovely green liquid. It's it's green because I, I did food coloring. <laughs> oh gosh. No, so these are actually just, it's just household chemicals. I didn't bring home chemicals, they're just household chemicals. So I looked around my house this morning and I was thinking of you know what I could do to do the reaction and to demonstrate these principles and I have them right here. No, this, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's on a tray, it's fine. Okay, so this is vinegar that I've, you know, food colored, right? Um, so vinegar, and then I, I watered it down a little bit, and I actually chilled it. So this is refrigerator temperature, um, and I have, um, I don't know. So this is vinegar with, that I'd, that's been chilled with a little food coloring added. Okay, um, and this is just a piece of baking soda that I've let kind of harden. Focus. Ah, my focus sucks. Okay, so you guys all know what happens when you mix baking soda and vinegar, but just in case you forgot. Okay, you'll notice here, this reaction is going slowly, right? Um, and I intentionally did that. Okay. You can hardly even see that it is forming bubbles. They're just very, very small bubbles. Right? It's reacting really, really slow. Let me zoom in. There you go. So you can see it's making really small bubbles. Right? Not very interesting. Not very exciting. Okay. Now, if I even I could poke it. Poke. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned a couple details that are explaining why it's going really slow. I chilled it, I diluted it, and I, I chilled it, I diluted it, and I had a chunk of baking soda. So how could we make this reaction go faster? How do you dilute vinegar? You just add water to it. 
Um, I could agitate it, but that doesn't really necessarily make it go faster. That just maybe causes it to dissolve a little bit. Okay, so I can heat it up. Okay, so instead of having chilled vinegar, let's use room temperature vinegar. All right. So I have this one is yellow. Okay. So this is room temperature vinegar. Um, it's still been diluted. Um, but this time I'll use powder. So <clears throat> this is warmer, uh, and I'm going to use powdered baking soda instead of um, instead of the one big chunk. Okay, so powdered baking soda going in. You'll notice it's still pretty slow. Well, there's some bubbles in there. Little tiny bubbles forming, All right? So the big difference here is that I've diluted it. Concentration actually is a big factor, okay? Here, let me zoom out for you. So there's not actually a ton going off. Um, I have a catalyst for a different reaction, Simon. Okay, so again, diluted, boring, not that exciting. Okay, so for this last one okay this last one has not been diluted so this is pure vinegar we're gonna use powder and if I really wanted to I could like I could put it in a I could put it in a the microwave for a second and heat it up that would actually cause it to go pretty fast okay ready Okay, so the concentrated vinegar makes a huge difference to how fast the reaction goes, right? Um, okay. So <clears throat> there, there's a huge difference when we talk about concentration. And the reason why is that when you have higher concentrations, your atoms and molecules are gonna collide into each other a lot more frequently, and so you get a lot more collisions, okay? Uh, no kaboom. Now, <clears throat> There is one more thing. I don't have a catalyst for this reaction, but I do have a catalyst for a slightly different reaction. Okay, let's talk about Ow, as I stab myself. No, I'm not gonna drink the vinegar baking soda water. Let's talk about hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so hydrogen peroxide is chemical formula H2O2. Okay. The reason why hydrogen peroxide produces um, so much bubbles, or so many bubbles, is because it's constantly breaking down into water and oxygen gas. That's actually why it's stored in these dark bottles, is to prevent um, sunlight causing it to decompose faster. So hydrogen peroxide is constantly decomposing into hydrogen, or sorry, oxygen and water, right? So if you listen very closely, I wonder if my mic would pick this up. Listen very closely. Can you hear the bubbles? Okay, yeah, I, sh I literally shoved my microphone into the hydrogen peroxide container. So it is, it's decomposing really, really slowly. It's slowly breaking down. So if you ever like put your ear up to a container of hydrogen peroxide, you can hear it just barely bubbling away as oxygen gas is escaping. Okay, um, okay. Now, yeast has an enzyme in it that will catalyze the reaction. Okay, so here's some simple powdered yeast. I'm gonna add a little water to it to activate it. Say, wake up little yeast, wake up. Okay. <laughs> sure, Simon. So Simon says to add some soap. Right? So I'm going to let the yeast activate. I'm going to add some soap to my hydrogen peroxide. 
some blue slope soap. Yeah, so the reason why people put hydrogen peroxide on cuts and things, sores and things like that, um, is because of um, the fact that it it's a disinfectant of sorts. It's not a great disinfectant. Uh, it's okay. There, there are much better topical antiseptics, but. All right. So my yeasty boys are getting activated. Okay, they're waking up from their dehydrated sleep. Little bacteria is ready to go. Uh, I can't remember what the name of the catalyst is or the enzyme is that causes this, but. I could make bread. I know I have yeast to make bread, but instead we're doing this. Okay, so a catalyst a catalyst um, makes things go in a slightly different way. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this more in the notes, um, but the idea is that a catalyst provides an alternate pathway for the reaction. So instead of having to go up that big hill to form the activated complex, a catalyst will provide you know some other way for the reaction to proceed, which will lower the activation energy and have the reaction happen much more quickly. So hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide soap. Yeast. Let's see what happens. Spoon. Okay, here we go. Um, so I added the soap because the soap is going to catch the bubbles as they form. So the solution is going to bubble. It was going to bubble a lot on its own, uh, but Simon had told me to add some soap. So I added the soap to, it's going to catch the bubbles as, as these oxygen, as oxygen gas gets released from the reaction. Okay, here we go. Now you can't really see that from this angle, but is alive. Those poor yeasties. Okay, again, you can't see it from that angle. But it's growing. Oh shoot, I hope this doesn't overflow. <laughs> No, it's just forming white bubbles. Oh. oh. It's rising over the top. That's actually really cool. Now my finger's dirty. Oh, it's gonna overflow. Okay, that's why I have an extra container for it. I'm not gonna lick it. This is hydrogen peroxide soap and yeast. Why would I lick hydrogen peroxide? That's gross. Um, so Cooper, it's not, it, it does get really hot because it is a very exothermic reaction. So it does put off a lot of heat, but when they do elephant toothpaste as like a science demonstration, they use a much higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide. So I used 3%, they usually use like 10% or higher. Go get some milk. Um, <laughs> I want to kill you. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, but it's low concentration hydrogen peroxide. A hundred percent hydrogen peroxide is actually like explosive and almost impossible to isolate and obtain. So, hope you guys enjoyed that little demonstration. We're gonna do just a few things, a few notes to wrap it all together. Letter B. Um, no. 
You can't concentrate. Yeah, concentrating hydrogen peroxide is a very difficult thing to do because it, as you heat it up, it actually decomposes. So it's very difficult to increase the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. All right, let it be. Factors affecting rates. Number one, temperature. Hotter, it's faster. Right? <laughs> peroxidase. Ah, peroxidase. That's the name of the compound. Or that's the name of the catalyst. It's peroxidase. Um, did you look it up, Google, or Weaver, or did you just know that? Yeah, I, I, I know the enzyme is peroxidase. Okay. All right, so temperature, higher temperature, hotter temperatures is means the reaction is going to go faster. The reason that it goes faster is because um, temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, right? So our atoms and molecules move around really fast. And so at a higher temperature, they're going to collide into each other more frequently with more energy. And so they're going to form the activated complex more easily. I don't know, Zach. It's not just concentration, it's amount as well. So speaking of concentration, our second factor is concentration. Higher equals faster. So if you have a higher concentration, um, you would also get a faster reaction. Zoom in one. Yeah, that looks good. They're just factors in general, Lauren. So there's just a couple different ways to, to mess with a, a chemical reaction to make it faster. So you can increase the temperature, you can increase the concentration. Yeah, it's not necessarily the same order that we did them in. Uh, number three. Uh, surface area for solids. Um, right, greater equals faster. Okay, so that that's why a powder will react much more quickly than a um, you know chunk, right? Uh, my powdered baking soda reacted much more rapidly than my solid baking soda did. So, Kate, uh, the Mentos actually don't react with Coke. Um, they just provi provide what's called a nucleation site. It's, it's the fact that they actually have little craters on them. Um, the, the Mento itself doesn't really react. There are some chemicals that do. Mythbusters did a fantastic episode on uh, Mentos and Coke. Uh, I wonder if you can find it online.
don't try what you're about to see at home. Yeah, this is actually a pretty good link. Just Google, just Google Mythbusters Diet Coke and Mentos. They actually talk about all the chemicals and all the other stuff they put together. Um, Weaver should have the assignment uploaded. He uploaded it on Friday. Mm, I don't know about that, Cooper, but I could be wrong. I think that might just be created drama. All right, and lastly, number five. And this one we actually didn't demonstrate because I didn't have a good way to demonstrate it. Um, it. It's just basically saying that there are some compounds that are more reactive than others, right? So where it, it, instead of using vinegar, if I had used like hydrochloric acid, it would have reacted faster, right? So this is like if you actually change the chemicals, basically saying that different chemical reactions happen faster. But they could also react slower too, so it just kind of depends. Um, isotopes, Cooper? Um, only if you want to get really technical, like really technical. Um, you could maybe get into some issues with the rates and isotopes, because the heavier ones are going to be moving slower and they're going to react a little less frequently. But it's it's a very small relationship. Okay, let me double check things real quick. No, I'm looking at the worksheet. I can show you what I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm looking at the worksheet, making sure that I taught you guys everything that's on here. I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, so the submission for the worksheet hasn't been uploaded yet, but the worksheet itself is uploaded. I'm going to work on getting the submission done tonight. Um, I do want to mention probably one more thing. Um... So, how do I, mean, do I want to put this? Oh, I don't want to put this. Yeah, AP does, Isaac. We're going to go over that um, practice exam that I gave you guys over the weekend. And then we're going to just address any last concerns about the test. It was due last night. It's closed, Isaac. Actually, no, I think it's open until tonight. Go do it right now. You have an hour. Actually, you have 45 minutes. Yeah, I think I just gave you guys an extra day for people that forgot, but I wanted you guys to have it done before class today. Okay. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to talk about. So we're going to go through... So on Wednesday stream... Yeah, Cooper, nothing is due today. Uh, he's an AP. I'm talking about AP. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Uh, I hope so too, Simon. I hope so too. <laughs> sorry, Anna. Yeah, sorry, guys. I was talking to Isaac about AP. The AP has an assignment because they have the AP test is on. The AP exams start this week. So I think AP Geo is today, isn't it? Um, no, Lauren, that's not confirmed yet. There, there's been people making I suggestions and ideas, um, but there haven't been, um, anything confirmed about next school year yet. It's still kind of up in the air. 
Yeah, so APG is tomorrow. Um, Tyler, did you have a question? I guess not. Yep, Euro's on Wednesday. Mm, potentially Valen, but who knows? It's hard to say. Oh. Yeah, Caps should have finished. Should have finished. Um, yeah, so after you take your AP Geography grant exam, you can always tune into the uh, Brighton Esports team. We're playing our quarterfinal match tomorrow, and then we have our semifinals on Thursday, and then the finals are next Tuesday if we keep winning. So we'll see. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to talk about rates. Um, so this, I think, is it for rates of reaction. Um, if there's any other thing that I missed, uh, yeah, when we keep winning. The match today, the match tomorrow actually should be a blowout. We should just destroy them, so uh, we'll see. Uh, no, I, I don't play, Jonathan. I'm the coach. I mean, I'll practice with them sometimes, but I just coach. I can't, I can't compete in the game. It's only high school students. Yeah, I do play like when we're doing scrims and stuff. Um, yeah, Lauren, I think we're done. We're done. Yeah, we'll be done with the notes for today. <laughs> uh. Nonviolent, but it's a game where you 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 destroy the enemy's base and it's it's you kill people, not bloody kill people, but you you beat them. And Cooper hasn't even said all that much. You guys are trolls. Um, cool. So that's it for today. I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream, uh, so I can get ready for AP. Um, if you guys have any questions, work on the worksheet. I'll get it uploaded this afternoon. Um, <laughs> uh, so, oh shoot, I need to tell, yeah, yeah, that's a good announcement to bring up, Grayson. So, um, textbook turn-in starts next week. So, next Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're going to be, there's going to be time slots where people will come in and turn in textbooks. So you'll turn in all your books, you'll turn in anything that you've checked out from the school will get turned in. And that way, if you've had any fees for any classes, those will get refunded after you get everything turned in. Is kind of the way it's going to work. So you get all your books and everything turned in. Uh, once you get all your stuff turned in, if you had a fee for a class, that'll get refunded back to your account. So no, 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 next Wednesday. So that would be Wednesday the 20th. Wednesday the 20th. Wednesday the 20th. So, um, and that, the reason why you're turning in your books then is because your classes are supposed to be done by then. Um, they should be done after Friday. Um, so, take the weekend to finish up what it is. If you want to finish any late work or makeup work, you have next week to do that. Uh, we're going to finish up this week. This is really, this was kind of our last lesson of notes. Um... But yeah, seminary is kind of doing their own thing, Matthew. They're not part of the school, so they can do whatever they want. They could keep doing seminary through summer if they wanted to. Uh, yes, last question. So I'm going to go for maybe one or two more minutes before I end this out. Nice, Doritos. Okay. 
right. Oh, have a good day, guys. Have a good Monday. Um, I'll be in the Discord this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, tune into the esports team tomorrow if you want to watch them beat up either Weber, Weber Innovation or Bonneville Academy. Um, Wednesday, we'll talk over the homework. Friday, we'll go over what's going to be on the final. Final opens Friday. You can take it that day if you want, or you can wait until Sunday to take it. Um, I'll get grades updated. I'll try to get make sure everything's good to go so you guys know where you're sitting at. Um, yeah. Have a good rest of the day, guys.